Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for the grace and thy mercies, and thank you for such an hour as this. Lord, as we share in thy word, may you bless of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, warm welcome once again and uh, welcome to uh, the series, uh, welcome back to the series of uh, Minneapolis 1888 and uh, we are continuing with uh, our presentations. I just want to pray that uh, uh, after a long break uh, you will still uh, find uh, uh, the rhythm that uh, maybe could have been lost in these presentations. And uh, uh, I just want to end into another topic, which is uh, much more interesting, the topic of uh, uh, the nature of Christ, the topic of uh, the nature of Christ. Otherwise, I just want to thank the Lord that uh, uh, he has been uh, good to us and uh, he has been leading us step by step. Now, we previously saw the issue of uh, the covenants, the issue of the covenants, that is where we left uh, in uh, our last presentation. And uh, one of the messages of 1888 was, uh, when you look in the book by um, uh, E.J. Wagner, was um, the, the setting forth of the truth about God. And uh, I'd just like to go through some aspect of this message, praying that uh, it will be a blessing unto us and uh, it will continue uh, blessing our soul and guiding us into the way of uh, our righteousness. So without uh, maybe wasting a lot of time, I'd like just to go to this uh, presentation that is uh, the, the, the nature of Christ, the nature of uh, Christ. Though I'm having a, a problem with the network, but I hope uh, it will be a blessing unto us. So this, uh, this issue of uh, the nature of Christ, and uh, this is just uh, an introductory part. This is uh, an introductory part. And my prayer is that uh, it, will, uh, it will help us move closer to Christ. It will not just be information, but uh, it will be something to really bless our soul. And so, the nature of Christ. Uh, in uh, his book, Christ and His Righteousness, this is uh, what uh, E.J. Wagner says. There was a time when Christ proceeded forth and came from God, from the bosom of the Father, John 8.42, quoted in uh, John 1.18. But that time was so far back in the days of eternity that to finish comprehension, it is practically without uh, a beginning. Uh, Continued on comparing uh, what E.G. White, uh, what um, E.J. Wagner had to say in Christ and His Righteousness, page 12, paragraph 1, and what uh, E.G. White had uh, to say in uh, Science of the Time, that is uh, Science of the Time, May 30, 1895, paragraph 3. It is true that there are many sons of God. But Christ is the only begotten Son of God, and therefore the Son of God in ascend in which no other being ever was or ever can be. The angels are sons of God, as was Adam, Job 38.7, Luke 3.38, by creation. And so here is Wagona trying to do an expository on uh, the different kinds of being and how they are related to God. And we see that angels are sons of God as by creation. Christians are the sons of God by adoption, but Christ is the son of God by birth. That is the language that uh, E.J. Wagner uses. Now, 
um, coming on the side of E.G. where she says a complete offering has been made for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not a son by creation, as were the angels, nor a son by adoption, as it is the forgiven sinner, but a son begotten in the express image of the Father, pers uh, Father's person, and in all the brightness of the majesty and glory, one equal with God in authority, dignity, and divine perfection. In him dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so it is clear when somebody says begotten, it doesn't mean creation because uh, begotten is contrasted to creation and it is contrasted to uh, adoption. Uh, again, this is um, something also she had to say. Ellen White, however, um, Ellen White, however, was in no doubt as to the importance of the message which those two men had brought concerning the message she wrote. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with a form of his spirit in large measure. And uh, this is in Testimonies to Ministers, page 92. You will find that people will say that this is what he's talking about is justification by faith. And it is true, it is justification by faith. But if you read 91 and 92, it says that um, Christ uh, uh, is lifted up. They had to behold his divine nature. So this third angel's message, which is justification by faith, what the people had to behold is the divine nature of Jesus Christ because men had lost sight of Christ and they were looking after men. In uh, someone from New York, June 19, 1889, she said, I have heard the question asked, what do you think of this uh, life that these men are presenting? Why I have been presenting it to you for the last 45 years, the much less chance of Christ. This is what I have been trying to present before your minds when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis. Uh, it was the first clear teaching on this subject from any human lips I had heard, exceeding the conversation between myself and my husband. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly. And they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. And so, uh, whatever Wagona and uh, Jonas were presenting, actually, it was something that could resonate with the EG White. Again, uh, she says that um, in the first six chapters, in the divinity, in the first six chapters, that is uh, in Christ and his righteousness, the divinity of Christ is Wagner's focus to a great extent. He is trying to prove that Jesus was not created. He was not a lesser being than God. You know, sometimes when we say that Jesus Christ is the son of God, he is begotten, people tend to say that uh, this is uh, making of none effect of the divinity of Jesus Christ. But this is not making of that um, an effect of the divinity of Jesus Christ. He is not a lesser God. There is no imperfection in God. And so you cannot say, just as you cannot say this is a lesser human being, so you cannot at the same time say this is a lesser God. The one who redeemed as his true divine being, that was his focus. He was trying to show man the great and exalted work that has been done on our behalf. It was not a lesser being that died for humanity, but one who was higher than anything that created intelligent can fathom. If Christ had uh, a lesser or is a lesser God, then the angels were a perfect sacrifice for us and uh, humanity in his righteousness could be a perfect sacrifice. But Christ is not a lesser God. Christ is God by virtue of his sonship and there is no imperfection in God as is, there is no imperfection in humanity. You cannot say that this is a lesser human, so you cannot say that this is a lesser God. The price paid for us is infinitely great. Wagner realized that uh, people needed to understand who Christ was. They needed to have Christ exalted height as he truly was. If they were ever to relate to him in the right way, notice how Ellen White agreed that this was uh, what Wagner tried to express to the people. And she says in Review and Herald, May 27, 1890, messages bearing the divine credentials have been sent to God's people. The glory, the majesty, the righteousness of Christ, full of goodness and truth, have been presented. The fullness of the Godhead 
in Jesus Christ has been set forth among us with beauty and loveliness. And so the message of righteousness by faith was to set forth the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ. And she says that uh, Wagona did this in, um, in a very beautiful way and in a, a very uh, loving way, in beauty and loveliness. And so you have just to go back and read Christ and His Righteousness by E.J. Wagona and see how she sets forth the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ. And she says that this is to charm all whose hearts were not closed with prejudice. We knew that God has wrought among us. We have seen souls turned from sin to righteousness. We have seen faith revived in the hearts of uh, the conrite ones. The other version embraced by the present Seventh-day Adventist just said that Christ is God because he's one of three gods. He always was and always will be. There are these three beings who just happen to be there from all eternity. But Wagner was teaching something else, and when he told this something, Ellen White, preaching a sermon at Rome, New York, June 19, 1889, she said uh, that um, um, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in Minneapolis, it was the first clear teaching on the subject from any human lips I had had, except in the conversation between myself and my husband. I have said to myself, it is because God has presented to me in a vision that I see it so clearly, and they cannot see it because they have never had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, every fiber of my heart said, Amen. Why is the message so important? Why is the nature of Jesus Christ so important to us? That is the question that we have to look at. Um, in Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, uh, page 904, and 905 we read the humanity of the son of god is everything to us it is the golden link link chain which binds our soul to christ and through christ to god this is to be our study and so as he sets forth the fullness of the godhead in jesus christ he also talks of his humanity and why should we read all this about so that uh, we may know that uh, victory over sin is something that is uh, a possibility it is something that uh, can happen among us. Again, uh, we are told that um, Christ was a real man and he gave proof of his humility in becoming a man and he was God in the flesh. And the part of the man is the exemplary part that man by holding on the power of omnipotent because we know that uh, when Christ was here on earth, he depended on his father for, uh, 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 for, for overcoming. But uh, in giving the sacrifice, he died as um, God, a divine being with all the attributes of, of uh, the Godhead. And so uh, the one who died on Calvary was um, one who could satisfy the demands of the law. The law demanded a divine being to die. The law is a transcript of God's character. And so if the law is a transcript of God's character, no human can die for humanity to satisfy the demands of the law. One who is equal with God must die so as to meet the demands of the law because it is a transcript of God and if it is broken, then one who is equal with God and having the attributes of God can only satisfy the demands of uh, the same law. Nothing less uh, than that. When we approach the subject of Christ's divinity clothed with the garb of humanity, we may appropriately heed the words of, spoken by Christ to Moses at the burning bush. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where on thou standest is holy ground. And uh, this is the place that we have to be very careful because there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of philosophy, there's a lot of borrowing sentiments from uh, those people who think that um, they are inspired when they are not inspired. Uh, the word of God should be sufficient for us through the written, uh, the canonical and non-canonical prophets, it should be a sufficient evidence for us to present the truth as it is in Jesus Christ and not suppositions and what human beings may want for. And so this truth, it helps us bring to light an understanding of uh, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In 1 John 3, 9, that uh, whoever is born of God, um, uh, cannot sin because the seed of he who has born him remains in, uh, in him. And 1 John 5, 18, 
that uh, uh, who overcomes, uh, who can overcome the world, but he that believeth that, that Christ is the Son of God. Then Jude 24, 25, that he who can keep you from sinning, to him be glory and honor forever and forever. Amen. And then uh, uh, that which we lost when Adam fell, we get back to faith in Jesus Christ. We become the seed of Christ that Adam restored and much more. And humanity combined with divinity does not seem the secret of victory over sin. And so we have Jesus Christ as um, the Son of God with the fullness of the Godhead and uh, the Son of Man uh, as a human depending on the Father for overcoming and uh, by coming and showing us an example. He does not only show us an example, but he procures for us the power to do the same. And uh, as we read in Ephesians chapter 4, that um, he who descended is the one that ascended. And why did he do that? So that he may fill all things. Fill them with what? According to Hebrews 9.14, the eternal spirit that can cleanse our conscience that we may be able to be purged from our dead works and serve the living God because it is that eternal spirit that helped him to be able to uh, offer himself without spot. Now, what about that eternal Holy Spirit? That eternal spirit is um, the divinity of God himself. It is uh, the fullness in the Godhead. It carries the, all the power of the Godhead, and that is from the Father. And so the Father gives to the Son and the Son unto us. Jesus Christ is the conduit. He is the way, the truth, and no one comes to the Father but by him. And uh, you read Desire of Ages 21 that uh, 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 the Spirit flows, uh, the, the, the beneficence of love. It, uh, it flows through the Son. That is the Spirit unto the believer and from the believer back with a title. Uh, of beneficent love to the Father, and so uh, the, 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 the power of God to uh, be able to recreate man in holiness, to be able to, uh, you know, when man was created, he was in the likeness, in the image of God. He lost that. And so God, in order to recreate man, must give him what he lost, that uh, a spirit of God, that eternal spirit, so that uh, he may be able to overcome and live in righteousness. In uh, 1888, 344, paragraph 1, we read that, uh, but must but must works come first? No, it is faith first. And how the cross of Christ is lifted up between heaven and earth. And you can study more about the cross and the ladder that uh, 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 reaches in heaven and connects heaven to the earth. Here comes the Father and the whole train of holy angels. That is the ladder, the cross. And as I approach that cross, the Father bows to the cross and the sacrifice is accepted. Then comes sinful man with his burden of sin to the cross and he there looks up to Christ on the cross of Calvary and he rolls his sins at the foot of the cross. Here mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And Christ says, if I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. And how can Christ draw all men to him? It is through that efficacious spirit which um, uh, uh, he, he uh, which helped him to offer the sacrifice with those thought. And so in 1888, uh, material page 332, paragraph 1, we again read, Christ could have done nothing during his earthly ministry in saving fallen man in there if the divine had not been blended with the human. And so we saw that these two natures were blended together. And for what reason? Humanity to hold upon humanity and uh, divinity to hold upon divinity. And so he is the ladder that connects heaven to the earth. While the divine holds the hand of the infinite God, the humanity actually uh, 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 grasps the hand of a penitent uh, 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 a sinner who is repenting and have a contrite heart the spirit wooing and connecting the two, the human, the human and the divine. The limited capacity of man, I just read again, Christ could have done nothing during his earthly ministry in saving fallen man if the divine had not been blended with the human. The limited capacity of man cannot define this wonderful mystery. The blending, uh, the two natures, uh, the divine and the human, 
It can never be explained. Man must wander and be silent, and yet man is privileged to be a partake of the divine nature, and in this way he can, to some degree, enter into the mystery. What mystery? The uh, uh, combination, the blending of uh, uh, divinity and humanity. Man cannot define this wonderful mystery, but uh, he can just, uh, in a degree, enter into it, not define it. Listen, man can only enter into this mystery, not define it. The blending of the divine and humanity, no one can define it. But we can only enter into that ministry by doing what? By being partakers of divine nature, by holding on the hand of omnipotent. This wonderful exhibition of God's love was made on the cross of Calvary. Divinity took the nature of humanity and for what purpose? that through the righteousness of Christ, humanity might partake of the divine nature. Thus, a union of divinity and humanity, which was possible with Christ, is incomprehensible to human mind. You know, sometimes we have done a lot of specula speculation, including me, myself, but uh, I, I'm finding that uh, there's, no, there's, no, there, there's no profit, there's no uh gain that we get in entering into speculations and the same things that we cannot prove or uh, things that we cannot really explain so well um uh, it's only god who can be able to explain this wonderful ministry man um this, uh, this, 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 this issue is incomprehensible to human minds. What has been revealed to us is for us and for our children. The wonderful things to take place in our world, the greatest events of all ages are incomprehensible to worldly minds. They cannot be explained by human senses. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. Christ is coming in power and uh, great glory. But his coming is not such a mystery as the things to take place before that event. Man must be a uh, partake of the divine nature in order to stand in this evil time. When the mysteries of satanic agencies are at work, only by the divine power united with the human can souls endure through these times of trial. Says Christ, without me you can do nothing. Then there must be far less of self and more of who? Of Jesus. In uh, in uh, Science of the Time, May 10, 18, 99, paragraph 11, uh, again we read, but although Christ's divine glory was for a time veiled and eclipsed by his assuming humanity, and you know what is an eclipse? An eclipse doesn't mean that the other system is not there. It is there, but it has been eclipsed. It has been overshadowed by the one which is in front of it. And so we cannot say that Christ ceased to be God because he had partaken of uh, humanity. No, that is not the thing. But although Christ's divine glory was for a a time veiled and eclipsed by hum assuming humanity, yet he did not cease to be God when he became man. We read, the human did not take the place of the divine, nor the divine of the human. The, this is the mystery of godliness. The two expressions, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparable one, inseparably one. And yet they had a distinct individuality. So, the one nature could not mess with the other and the other could not mess with the other. The two expression, human and divine, were in Christ closely and inseparable one, but yet had a distinct individuality. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. And look at this statement, his deity, because I'll be talking about a, a risk of eternal loss. The Godhead was his still when he became human but on what uh, on what ground his deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty you can really uh, 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 see what actually the, the message of the Lord is saying that his deity could not be lost while he stood faithful and true to his loyalty what if he did not stand faithful and true to his loyalty his deity could be lost but I'll tackle this in the uh, I'll be going through the risk of eternal loss and uh, look at this statement so keenly. So these two natures, we are just looking at the introduction, the nature of Christ, that the divine and the human were blended. And for what reason? For humanity to grasp upon humanity and divinity to grasp upon divinity. For humanity to show an example and give us an assurance that human beings can have victory over sin. And for divinity, for what? For the 
pay of the penalty of sin. Surrounded with sorrow, suffering and moral pollution, despised and rejected by the people to whom he had been entrusted the oracles of heaven, Jesus could yet speak of himself as the Son of Man in heaven. He was ready to take once more his divine glory when his work on earth was done. He, the Christian, may die, but the life of Christ is in him. And, uh, you know, our life is hid in Christ. And uh, we don't become gods when we partake of the divine nature in that we can self-exist. Our life is still hid in Christ. So the life of Christ is in him, that is, uh, the Christian who may die. And that at the resurrection of the just, he will rise to newness of life. In him, Christ was life, and the life was the light of men. You can read that in John um, uh, 5, 25 and 26. It is not physical life that is here specified, but immortality, the life which is exclusively the property of God. The word who was with God and who was God had this life. Physical life is something which each individual receives. It is not eternal or immortal. For God, life giver takes it again. Man has no control over his life. But the life of Christ was unborrowed and uh, uh, I know many people have commented on this, uh, that uh, unborrowed means that uh, he is the originator of it. No desire of ages. The great source of all life is God the Father, and Christ has received it as a son. And also we shall receive the original unborrowed life, but we shall still be dependent on the Father. So to argue that uh, the life of Christ, because it was original and borrowed and derived, then it means that uh, he was not in reality the son of God, but uh, the, 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 the title or the phrase begotten means his uh, birth or incarnation on earth. It really means a very important point because even human beings will have this life, but uh, as we will have it, it will have a beginning. It is not that we have had it all uh, the days of our life. If we had it, then they will have not been dead uh, anyway. And so, but the life of Christ was unborrowed. No one can take this life from him. I lay it down of myself, he said. In him was life original and borrowed and derived. This life is not inherent in man. This is not something we have. Yet, look at the statement. He can possess it in only through Christ. Man can possess this original and borrowed and drive life. So this is something that uh, somebody can come to possess. And uh, Christ, by virtue of his sonship to God, he has that life inherent. By us being adopted as Christian, then we have it uh, by adoption. While bearing human nature, he, Christ, was dependent upon the omnipotent for his life. Look at that statement. Although Christ had this life original and borrowed and undrived, yet with all this life, he depended on the omnipotent, which is his father, for his life. And so you can have this life and still depend on one who is greater than you. So in his humanity, he laid hold of the divinity of God. He did not hold on the divinity of himself. When Christ was upon this earth, he did not hold on his divinity. He held on the divinity of God. And this, every member of the human family has the privilege of doing it. He laid down voluntarily. Uh, and uh, um, uh, when uh, he resurrected, then he assumed the usage of that life which was inherent in him, the life original and drive and borrow. In uh, Bible Echo, March 15, 1893, paragraph 3, again, uh, uh, this is uh, what we read. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. We can make no atonement for ourselves, but by faith we can accept the atonement that has been made. For Christ also had once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as one as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. No man of earth, no angel of heaven could have paid the penalty for sin. Jesus was the only one who could save rebellious man. In him, divinity and humanity are combined, and this was what gave efficacy to the offering, uh, to the offering on Calvary's cross. And so, if Christ was only human, missing the divine nature, the offering at Calvary could not be efficacious. 
So it behooved the father that he has a son who has divinity and humanity combined in that body so that it is a divine being that dies at Calvary. Otherwise, it could have been only a human sacrifice. In the future, deception of every kind is to arise and we want solid ground for our feet. We want solid pillars for the building. Not one thing is to be removed from that which the Lord has established. Where shall we find safety unless it be in the truth that the Lord has been giving for the last 50 years? And this is the truth that he had been giving for the last 45 years. No one was understanding them, but when Wagona presented them in 1888, every fiber of her being said, Amen, uh, because uh, uh, it seems something so new, but actually it was just placing the old light in the right place, the light that had been buried in the uh, 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 bucket of uh, traditions and uh, human philosophy. And so he says, we hold no doctrine that we wish to hide. To those who have been educated to keep the first day of the week as a sacred day, the most objectionable feature of our faith is the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. But does not God's word declare that the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord our God? True, it is not an easy matter to make the required change from the first to the seventh day. It involves a cross. It clashes with the precepts and practices of men. Learned men have taught the people tradition till they are full of unbelief and prejudice. Yet, we must say to these people, come and see. God requires to us to proclaim the truth and let it discover uh, error. And why is this uh, Sabbath issue brought in? Because um, in proclaiming the Sabbath, we proclaim the God of that Sabbath. There cannot be a true worship of the Sabbath with a wrong understanding of the God we worship. Now, I, I would like to be understood better that I'm not saying Anyone who hasn't come to the truth that um, uh, should be come to and is worshiping God according to the light they have can be rejected, whether it be a Sunday keeper, a seven-day Adventist, or whoever. God accepts us at the level that we are according to the light that we have received. But when light has been presented to us and ignorantly or um, stubbornly we remain ignorant about it or we keep our, our self away so that we may not get into touch with truth god judges us as if we went and listened to the truth and rejected it and so the god of the sabbath must be understood for the sabbath to be kept holy uh, otherwise uh, we will not be proclaiming the sabbath fully if we didn't understand the god that we were we are worshiping in uh, letters in manuscript volume 5 MS 24, 1888, paragraph 30. And this is still the message of uh, justification by faith. But when you go through the first chapters of the book, Christ in His Righteousness by E.J. Wagoner, he sets forth the beauty of who the Father is, the Son, and the Spirit is, so that when he enters into the message of justification by faith, we may be able to grasp uh, who are we worshiping, uh, how are we getting victory over sin? Who is giving us victory over sin? And uh, how is uh, <clears throat> the plan of redemption laid down? In fact, when you read about the plan of redemption in Zechariah 13, we are told that uh, he shall sit in the temple and the council of peace shall be between them both. This is the plan of salvation. This is the sanctuary language. And the council of peace is between them both. And so the council of peace and the plan of redemption goes hand in hand, and we cannot proclaim fully the message of justification by faith by not understanding the counsel of peace, who it is between. You know, if we add another third or fourth party in the counsel of peace, then we may end up giving glory and honor to somebody who is not uh, 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 who is not worthy to receive our, our worship. And glory. And so we are just looking at uh, Jesus Christ and his nature and how he has to fit in in the uh, plan of redemption and uh, uh, why he is the one that is um, the mediator between man and God. In these messages in 1888, Sister White says that the divine picture of Christ must be kept before the people. And I'm just looking at this issue of uh, the two natures in uh, Jesus Christ. The divine picture of Christ must be kept before the people. Uh, and many people do not like this because um, 
when you're talking about the divine picture of Jesus Christ, you must set him forth for who he is before the people. And this is where actually the problem comes because when you try to talk about who is Christ and uh, uh, what is his nature and what role does he play in the plan of redemption, uh, it gets to a point that uh, actually it uh, rises the temperatures in the uh, lives of the people because there are things that are not, uh, 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 does not sit well with them. So the divine picture of Christ must be kept before the people. He is that angel standing in the sun of heaven. He reflects no shadows, clothed in the attributes of deity, shrouded in the glories of deity, and in the likeness of the infinite God, he is to be lifted up before men. So men had been used looking at man, but the divine picture of Christ should be kept before them. For what purpose? For the atoning power that he gives back to humanity so that they may be overcomers. When this is kept before the people, creature merit sinks into insignificance. The more the eye looks upon him, the more his life, his lessons, his perfection of character are studied, the more sinfully and abhorrent will sin appear. By beholding, man can put, can but admire and become more attracted to him, more charmed and more desirous to be like Jesus until he assimilates to his image and has the mind of Christ. Like Enoch, he walks with God. His mind is full of thoughts of Jesus. He is his best friend. Again, the third angel's message will not be comprehended. The light which will lighten the earth with his glory will be called a false light by those who refuse to walk in its advancing glory. The work that might have been done will be left undone by the rejecters of truth because of their unbelief. We entreat of you who oppose the light of truth to stand out of the way of God's people. Let heaven send light shine forth upon them in clear and steady rays. God holds you to whom this light has come, responsible for the use you make of it. Those who will not hear will be held responsible, for the truth has been brought within their reach, but they despise their opportunities and privileges. Messages bearing the divine credentials have been sent to God's people, the glory, the majesty, the righteousness of Christ. And so the message that uh, Wagner and Jones were presenting were messages that had divine credentials, full of goodness and truth, and they had been presented. The fullness of what the Godhead in Jesus Christ has been set forth among us with beauty and loveliness to charm all those whose hearts were not closed with prejudice. We know that God has wrought among us. We have seen souls stand from sin to righteousness. And so the third angel's message is a message bearing divine credentials. It is a message of the righteousness of Christ. It is also a message that sets the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ. There is no way we can say that we have the third angel's message. And then that message does not bear divine credentials. That message does not speak of the righteousness of Christ, and that message does not set the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ. This is what E.G. White is talking about in 1888, that the third angel's message will not be comprehended. Some will think that uh, it is a people just uh, uh, making noise, want to be divisive, divisive and uh, all this stuff, but... Uh, this is the part of not comprehending it. In uh, TM 91, paragraph 2, talking about this message of righteousness by faith, the Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through the El through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person again, divinity and humanity in one. His merits and his changeless love for human family, all power is given into his hand that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world, and he is, he is still commanding it to be given today. It cannot change. It is the third angel's message. The message that has 
This is the third angel's message that it has the divine credential. It is the righteousness of Christ and the setting of uh, the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ, his divine person. It must come out so well. It is the third angel's message which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in large measure. The afflicted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the Lamb slain, sitting upon the throne to defend the priceless covenant blessings, the benefits he died to purchase for every soul who should believe on him. John could not express that love in words. It was too deep, too broad. He calls upon the human family to behold it. In fact, when you go to COL, is it uh, paragraph, page 415, paragraph 5, he says that uh, those who wait for the bridegroom, they must tell uh, the people, behold the man, behold your God. That is the message that they have to give to the people. Christ is pleading for the church in the heavenly course above, pleading for those for whom he paid the redemption price of his own life blood. Centuries, ages can never diminish the efficacy of this atoning, path, or atoning sacrifice. The message of the gospel of his grace was to be given to the church in clear and distinct lines that the world should no longer say that Seventh-day Adventists took the law, the law, but uh, do not teach or believe uh, Christ. The price paid by both due to the Council of Peace, as I bring this to a close, the price paid by both due to the Council of Peace. In Zechariah 6.13, we are told, Even he shall be the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the Council of Peace shall be between them both. Now, the price of sin was paid by them both. And um, you have just to go to 2 Corinthians 5, and um, uh, verses 17 and 18 and to 19 that to wit Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God was in Christ. Divinity was in the Son reconciling the world unto the divinity, unto God. And so uh, that is a play of words. Now, as surely as the counsel was between them both, so was the paying of the price. You know what? If God was not in Christ, if divinity was not in Christ, then Christ could have not paid the price. Then the counsel of peace could have not been accomplished. That is, the sacrifice could have been human sacrifice. So, Youth uh, instructed December 16, 1897, paragraph 5, as the disciples comprehended it, as their perception took hold of God's divine compassion, they realized that uh, there is a sense in which the sufferings of the Son were the sufferings of the Father. Think about, digest that uh, for a moment. From eternity, there was a complete unity between the Father and the Son. No three beings. There were two, yet little short of being identical. There were not three, little short of being identical. There were two, yet little short of being identical. Two in individuality, yet one in spirit and heart and character. And so the suffering of the son was the suffering of uh, the father. You know, sometimes we say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him must not perish but have everlasting life. And then what sticks in our mind is Jesus Christ died for us. And so there's this magnification of uh, uh, the son as the extent of the father, uh, and then the people forget about God so loved the world that he gave his son. He did not withhold anything. In his son, he gave himself. And we, we are just about to read this statement. That this redemption might be ours. God withheld not even the sacrifice of himself. He gave himself in his son. Divinity was in the son. Two natures blended together. And there is a way the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of the Son were linked in that at uh, Calvary, we are told that there was sundering of divine powers. There is a way that the Spirit in the Son and in the Father, they are so intertwined together. They are so one in that what happens to the other will happen to the other. Uh, not that uh, when the Son dies, the Father can die. That should not be understood like that. But... Uh, the pain that this son goes through and groans, actually, there is a way that is there are linked uh, with the with the father. That I, I can't explain that; it is incomprehensible. 
to me. The father suffered with Christ in all his humiliation and agony. He suffered as he saw the son of his love despised and rejected by those whom he came to elevate in noble and save. He saw him hanging upon the cross, mocked and jeered by the passers-by, and he hid as it were his face from him. He saw Christ bearing the sin of the world and dying in the sinner's stead. The human heart knows the love of a parent for his child. We know what a mother's love will do and suffer for her beloved one, but never can the heart of man fathom the depths of God's self-sacrifice. 2 Corinthians 5.19 to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Again, uh, we are told not above, not above the paying of the death of sin involved the Father too. It is only through simplistic definition of the phantom and the price of sin that we conclude it was paid by Jesus uh, alone actually. Uh, reading on in uh, 16 MR 193.1, I wish to say that no human language could be framed to give a just conception of the fullness of the love of God, even the infinite God who suffered in his son, and nothing he could express in his words or action in doing and suffering could possibly exaggerate the conception of the grace of that great love of God wherewith he hath loved us now what is required of every child of God. To search diligently and learn what that minute I'll have mercy and not sacrifice Matthew 9.13. We'll all respond individually who claim to believe in Christ as their personal savior. All who truly believe Christ has developed the same in his individual members of his body to multiply the similitude of his character and them. So Christ has done what? Uh, multiplied the similitude of himself in the members of our body that we may obtain his character. But remember, in the book of Philippians, we are also told by Paul, uh, I presume it's uh, Philippians 3.19, that I may not be found by my own righteousness, but the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the righteousness is of God, but it is obtained by faith in his son. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing sin unto them, but imputing his own righteousness. So the Father was in the Son in a mysterious way to impart his own righteousness through the Son because the Son is uh, the, the ladder between uh, heaven and earth. The cross, the cross, it is set up that we may understand and know the only true God in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. This is John 17, 3. It tells us of the depth and breadth of infinite love, the greatness of the Father's love. It reveals the astonishing truth that God the Father gave himself in his Son, that he might have the joy of receiving back the sheep that was lost. This is 17 MR 214, paragraph 2, self-explanatory. Uh, in MS 50, 1900, found in uh, 7 BC, 974, paragraph 1. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, Philippians 2, 6, commanding, Satan uprooted from affections of the universe in carrying out his enmity to Christ until he hung upon the cross of Calvary. With wounded, bruised body and broken heart, Satan completely uprooted himself from the affections of the universe. It was then seen that God had in his son denied himself, giving himself for the sins of the world because he loved mankind. And so the divinity of the son is the divinity of the father. And um, the spirit of the son is the spirit of the father. And so whatever the son was going through is actually what the father felt. The creator was revealed in the son of the infinite God. Here the question, can there be self-denial with God, was forever answered. Christ was God and condescending to be made flesh. He assumed humanity and became obedient unto death that he might undergo infinite sacrifice. The two natures blended together. You can see how you cannot escape this idea that uh, the two natures were blended together in Jesus Christ because God was in the Son, reconciling the world unto himself. So divinity was in humanity, reconciling the world unto uh, the Father. God has measured how much it costs to save man. 
this salvation was accomplished only by the sacrifice of himself in his son. Now, mm -hmm. if, if, if the father was in the son, you cannot say that uh, Christ was only having one nature. It, 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 can't, it can't, logically, it can't apply. Christ had two natures, the nature of the father or the nature of God and the nature of humanity. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Earthly parents love their children. How then did God feel when the son of his love was despised by those who he came to elevate and ennoble and said, he saw him dying on the cross, mocked at, at and jeered at by the passers-by, and he, he hid as it were his face upon him. Christ was bearing the sin of the whole world and dying in the sinner's stead. Exalt the God of heaven, you who can realize the depth of his self-sacrifice, for he suffered with his son. And so we have this statement, he suffered in his son, and also he suffered with his son. Now, he suffered in his son, that is prior to crucifixion. But when the sins of the world were actually on Jesus Christ, Actually, there was the divine sundering at the death of Jesus Christ. And then when Christ died, the Father suffered with his son. And um, I wish I could expand on that point much more, that uh, the Father did not die, the Son died. A divine being died, and there was the sundering of the divine powers, and the Father suffered with the Son after suffering in his Son prior to that. When man, beguiled by Satan, disobeyed the divine law, God could not, even to save the lost race, change that law. God is love. His law is an expression of his character. To change his law would be to deny himself. It will overthrow those principles which, with which are bound up the well-being of the whole universe. But um, we are told, uh, but in order to save the sinner, the creator sacrificed himself. The father suffered in his son. The message of God's love is Christ. The Savior's sacrifice was not to create in God a love that had not before existed, but it was the expression of a love that had not been appreciated or understood. What manner of love is this, that the eternal God should adopt human nature in the person of his son? Very, very interesting that term. Uh, you know, the Father begat the Son in the fullness of the Godhead. And so it was a part of himself. And then now, a part of God the Father has to assume humanity, combine divine divinity and humanity. So a part of the Father has to assume humanity in incarnation. And so that the eternal God should adopt human nature in the person of his son. You know, Jesus Christ is a part of God. You can read that in uh, um, Zeta Higher Call. I can't remember well. What man of love is that the eternal God should adopt human nature in the person of his son and carry uh, the same and carry the same into the highest heaven. Uh, this is um, Youth Instructor 29th, July 18 and 7, the gift of God's grace. <clears throat> Again, God showed his love for us by adopting, adopting our nature. In the person of his son, God himself inhabited humanity. You, 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 you remember that uh, uh, statement that um, um, an eternal spirit dwelled in the temple of flesh. Now, you know the eternal spirit belongs to the Father because it is his divinity, it is his divine nature, and it dwelt in the temple of flesh. Gave his son, and then his son came to the earth, making us partakers of the divine nature that by the incarnation and death of his only begotten son, our adoption as heirs of God and joined heirs with Christ might be fully accomplished. Youth Instructor 16, December 1897. The gospel testified that God in his boundless love for man assumed humanity in the person of his son. God himself became man and bore the entire wrath that sin had provoked. The second temple was not honored with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the living presence of one in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who was God himself manifest in flesh. And there are statements that talk about God in humanity 
and um, God manifest in the flesh that applies specifically to Jesus Christ. And there are those that really speaks about the Father uh, 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 being in Christ in a mysterious way, unexplainable, uh, and uh, suffering with him, the divinity and humanity combined together. The law of God could not be set aside even to save lost man. The well-being of the universe demanded that the divine government should be maintained. But in his infinite love and mercy, the creator sacrificed himself in his son. God himself bore the penalty of transgression. That the, he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. And remember the issue is the two natures of Jesus Christ. And since the law is divine and a transcript of God's character, nothing less could atone for that law because it's divine. So it's only divinity that can atone for that sacrifice. So the human nature of Jesus Christ is for our example and the divine nature is for the atonement. Christ himself was the word, the wisdom of God, and in him God himself came down from heaven and clothed himself in the, in the habiliments of uh, humanity. This is the plan of redemption. Ellen G. White, Review and Herald, 1st February 1898. Again, because divinity alone could be efficacious, in the restoration of man from the poisonous bruise of the serpent, God himself, in his only begotten son, assumed human nature. And the weakness of human nature sustained the character of God, vindicated his holy law in every particular, and accepted the sentence of wrath and death for the sons of men. God displays his power and wisdom in the work of creation. He revealed his majesty in the giving of his law. And finally, in the person of his son, he came to the world to show his love and grace. God has adopted human nature in the person of his son. And so uh, we shall be looking at um, the issue of um, um, the issue about uh, the risk of eternal loss and uh, see how this thing is important that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not some role play or such a thing like and uh, to bring in a third individual when we are seeing that it is the father in the son and the son in the father is actually to destroy the plan of redemption and atonement. For if the council of peace can have three, then we are destroying the whole thing of Zechariah chapter 6, 13. It is the father's character that had been messed up with and now in his son, he gives himself through his divinity that has been given to the son. And then at the cross, there is this sundering out of powers uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the purpose of paying the uh, penalty and uh, for the father remaining the father and the son remaining the son. And so I pray that uh, we will be blessed and uh, we will continue learning together. And uh, may the good Lord be with us as uh, we continue uh, studying these things. I know that um, the Lord is seeking to revive us once again and uh, 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 as we draw closer to him, he will also draw closer uh, to us. And so may, may we be encouraged. May the mercies of God be with us until uh, we meet again. Shall we pray? Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for all that you've given to us and uh, thank you for such a wonderful sacrifice in thy son for your character to be revealed in us once again so we pray that uh, lord we may not take for granted this power that has been given in, in, unto us and uh, we may be able to hold the hand of the omnipotent the hand of your son that we may be able to walk with you the rest of our lives in jesus name 